Good morning. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, this is our sec second press conference of the day on habitable worlds in the solar system. And we have four scientists in the panel. Jean-Pierre Paul de Vere is from the uh, German Aerospace Center. Brittany Sch Schmidt from the University of Texas. Michelle Doherty from Imperial College in London and also science lead for, on ESA's JUICE mission. And Jonathan Lenin from University of Cornell. And they can start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I start. Um, it's just my. I'm from the DLR, as uh, mentioned just before, from um, Berlin. Um, I'm a leader of a group in the Helmholtz Alliance Planetary Evolution and Life, um, led by the director uh, Tilman Spohn. And um, I will give you a short overview of what we have found out during a mass simulation experiments and what we know about um, in connection with other experiments we have done in space and in relation to field. Um, investigations. Um, the first slide is just uh, showing you the samples we are using. There are cyanobacteria, there are lichens, um, snow algae, um, and it is especially very interesting to know that the lichens are one of the highlights in um, our investigations. So the message I want to um, emphasize and to point out is that um, according to the results we got that um, photosynthesis is possible in surface niches on Mars. So if there's a low amount of radiation, this is um, highly sufficient, and if uh, low amounts of UV radiation are not um, imp um, impacting these organisms, then you um, can measure under these conditions photosynthesis. So this is one of the first um, results we got. Um, previous results were published, but just with uh, um, short experimental um, um, days, so four days to seven days, one week just, and now we have enlarged it and we know that uh, during 34 days there is a possibility that these organisms can also adapt to the Martian conditions, simulated Martian conditions, I have to emphasize. So the adaptation of the polar lichens is one of the highlights to the Martian surface conditions. So cyanobacteria we have also tested. Um, it seems that there's the same um, um, yeah, result for a polar cyanobacteria, but um, the tendencies um, for tropic cyanobacteria in contrast and also lichens, um, um, there's a bad um, feedback and um, they are dead after f a few days. So the conclusion is that the terrestrial life most likely can adapt physiologically so uh, to the life, to life, to live on Mars. So it's not just testing um, before and after the simulation, but also testing photosynthesis during these conditions. And um, this means also that we have really to be very stringent and to, to, to look for um, if we uh, send um, um, some probes to, to the surface of um, planets, that planetary protection is very essential and important, and you have really to know which um, kind of organisms could be in contact with this. And another thing is that um, early origi uh, originating um, life on Mars, if life starts on Mars in the same way, in the t same time window, uh, 3.8 um, billion years ago or 4 billion years ago, uh, there's high debate. But if this is uh, the case, these life forms are able to adapt. We have really to think about adaptation during time to conditions, changing conditions, and the, the niches are most important to find out. So this is just the message to give you an overview. Um, in the slides, you can see that there are different areas where you can find these kind of polar uh, organisms, polygon-rich environment, fissures, cracks, uh, rocks, gullies, and so on. And um, mainly these organisms in these polar regions, which have the similarity to surface um, geomorphology on Mars, you can uh, think about these could be potential niches. Here again, just an overview to, to see we have studied these organisms in the field to have also a correlation and to see um, the relations between um, um, results we got in the, in the field and re, um, results we got under simulation conditions and even in space. These organisms were also in, um, during um, different uh, space exposure campaigns. So, uh, um, campaigns. so we have um, exposed them to, um, on the biopan 
um, uh, a hardware device on Photon M3. It's a satellite for 10 days, and we have exposed them for one and a half years. And on um, the results, you can see they are still able to grow or um, have physiological activity uh, besides the photosynthetic activity. But this was just tested, not in situ, before and afterwards. Now, to the um, results we got during a simulation, but in the lab, and um, the tendencies for photosynthesis were very amazing. Yeah. I'm finishing, this is the last slide. <laughs> um, photosynthesis um, is increasing, this is one of the results, um, during 34 days of exposure, Martian exposure time. So this was really amazing, and these are tendencies we are just looking for, but um, it seems that it is um, every time repeatable. And the next thing is that we saw that um, the stress results are decreasing, so that um, these organisms seem to adapt, and especially this lichen. And for, uh, we have also a nice um, information that if um, gas and humidity was not provided, then uh, the, the uh, activity was decreased. But afterwards, when we provide new gas, then there was again a high amount uh, comparable to, to field studies of photosynthetic activity. Cyanobacteria from tropic region, one example here, are just after four days uh, closely to dead. And just to give you an overview what could be Maybe that they, they are able to have a kind of holiday on Mars. We don't know what happens further on, if uh, this is still going on on longer times, but please keep in mind experiments with long durations and just in lab is very, it's not easy, especially you have a lot of devices to, to measure and um, you need also these um, um, simulation um, uh, facilities for other experiments. Thank you. All right, um, so my name is Brittany Schmidt. I'm a research scientist associate at the University of Texas, um, where I work with my uh, co-authors here, Donald Blankenship, Krista Soderlund, and a whole group of people. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be talking to you today about Europa, which is the innermost icy moon of Jupiter. It's about the size of the Earth's moon. And one of the biggest questions out there is basically, is Europa able to support life? And in terms of life, what we mean is basically how uh, does the system cir circulate? Does it recycle material from the surface into its interior? And that's important because at its most basic, life is kind of like a battery. It basically is pushing electrons around from one place to another. And so the redox chemistry of the environment in which it lives is very important. On Europa, um, this figure is basically showing um, that we have a, a, an energetically bombarded surface that produces oxidants and then a reducing environment at the interior, potentially because of hydrothermal vents much like those on Earth. So the question for a long time has been, does this material recycle from the surface down into the ocean? So that's what I'm gonna address here. And I'm gonna address that using terrains called chaos terrains. And they're a unique geological feature to Europa and we'd like to ask the question, what does that tell us about the system? Chaos terrain um, I'm showing here is, uh, this is Connemara chaos, it's probably the archetype chaos terrain on Europa. Um, and it's characterized by things like floating iceberg-like uh, ice blocks, um, matrix, which is this churned up uh, semi-polygonal material in between icebergs, um, large fractures, um, both pre-existing geology and new fractures, and then major cliff boundaries. And so um, as we looked at chaos terrain, we decided to take a different perspective um, relative to earlier work. What we were aware of is that in, uh, on Jupiter, or I'm sorry, on Europa, um, solid state exchange, so basically mantle convection style uh, heat exchange might be responsible for creating thermal exchange between the deep interior and the surface. And chaos terrain is thought to represent that. Um, but what we wanted to do is kind of look in our backyard and see if we had any examples of things that looked like this. What I'm showing here is the Wilkins um, ice shelf and on the left, and then on the right, that same image of Europa. And what you notice they have in common are those same things. Fractures, um, tall cliffs, you'll see right, right here on Europa, and then over here um, on these icebergs. And so what's, what's being shown on the left is a, uh, is a collapsing ice shelf. Essentially, it's a fracture-controlled process where a little bit of water gets inside really strong ice and breaks out huge icebergs. So it was reminiscent of that. So what that led us to 
um, was a model of, of how these chaos terrains might form on Europa based on analog environments on Earth. And this was published in uh, Nature in November. I'm going to show you a video of what we think is happening. So here we're, we're flying by Jupiter, zooming into Europa, and we're going to look at a region called Thera Macula. So we're in this cutaway. What you can see is that warm material, warm water from below starts to heat the bottom of the ice. That ice moves up, causes a lake to start forming and melting, which fractures up the ice above it as the surface collapses. And then as the whole system refreezes, there's another thermal exchange which causes the surface to dome back up. So what you have is kind of a, a system where the ice collapses as it melts, all of the icebergs translate around, and then the surface pops back up. So what that gives us is a way to explain, pardon me, Sorry. is a way to explain um, chaos terrain uh, in terms of what, what it really means. And so here in this slide, I'm showing you two examples of chaos terrains. On the right, that's Connemara chaos, the same image I showed you before. And on the left is a feature called Thera Macula, the one that I showed you in the video. And what we think these two objects represent is kind of an end state of collapsed features on Europa. On the left, we have an active feature where the the surface is collapsed down. There's probably a liquid lens um, comparable in volume to the Great Lakes in uh, North America below this particular feature. And the icebergs are still floating. On the right on Connemara, you see that the icebergs are actually trapped in dome-shaped matrix, which is a, a signature that this lens has probably refrozen. So we have active water on the left, frozen water on the right. But what also is interesting is if we go back to the Earth, um, we get an example of what this might be doing to the surface of Europa, which is what we want to know. Is that surface material getting down into the deep interior? This is a video of Jakobshavn Isbre, so it's a calving front of a major glacier in Greenland. And what you're going to see is icebergs tipping over, and right here we're going to see a huge one flip over. So what you can see is that the instability caused by floating ice and a little bit of water inside a fracture is causing the surface to churn over and mix downwards. What you also notice is that there's never really liquid water on the surface. What's happening is a little bit of liquid water is doing a whole lot of work, but it's allowing the surface to mix down into the ocean. And so if we think about what that might mean for Europa, it tells us perhaps that not only is Europa active because of these chaos features, but there's also surface ocean exchange. It might look something like this. We know that Europa has a very young surface. We know it takes about 10 to the 4 years, so about 10,000 uh, 10, to 20,000 years for a plume to rise through uh, an ice shell of 10 to 15 kilometers. What we now know is that it probably takes around 100,000 years or more for these lenses to refreeze. But as that's doing that, the surface material that's been mixed down into the lake is going to sequester itself at the bottom of the lake and be the last to refreeze, which then allows this material down here to be enriched in, in non-ice materials and to sink relatively quickly through the surface, um, through the ice. So we have material moving up and down, but we also have evidence that it's moving sideways. And so here what we see actually is that there's some evidence for liquid water making it out of those lenses and being pushed into the surface terrain surrounding chaos features. And these both suggest are, are suggestive that, in fact, there's a large lens of pressurized water that exists prior to the formation of chaos. So what that gives us is a picture of what areas on Europa might be habitable, rather than just thinking about it in terms of whether the ocean is habitable. In fact, now we have not only the ocean, but brine-soaked water that's allowing the icebergs to flip over. We have the liquid lakes themselves. We have refrozen material that might be brine-rich. We have brine flows laterally from these chaos terrains, but we also have potentially accreting ice that's chemically different at the bottom of this ice shell where this interaction is taking place. So we think we have examples of a whole new host of habitats on Europa not previously recognized. Oh. And what I wanted to say as a transition <laughs> is, in fact, that um, using radar here on Earth, we've been able to detect features like this. Um, radar is one of the instruments that's proposed for the JUICE mission, um, which Michelle's going to talk about in a minute. But these are two examples of radargrams on the left showing the detection of a subglacial lake. Um, that hard reflection right here is the radar interacting with the top of the water. And on the right, I'm showing you an environment where water-filled fractures are moving up towards the surface. And all of these are detectable by radar, such as that which is proposed for JUICE. I'm sorry. It turns out that the presentation isn't on here. It's on my USB stick. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so if you grab your USB stick, we'll... Yep. yep. Jonathan, do you want to go ahead? Well, now? except this is chaos here, so we want to, yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm not going to talk over the technical stuff, okay. sorry. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yep. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a, a mission, a European mission called JUICE, which is to go to the Jupiter system, and it follows on very nicely from Brittany's presentation. What JUICE will do is explore three icy moons at Jupiter in detail, as well as explore the biggest uh, gas giant planet in our solar system. The three moons we're going to be looking at are Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa. And in some ways, what we will do is explore two of the five bodies of planetary families that have been ident identified in the galaxy this far. And as you can see on the bottom of this picture here, you have five families ranging from the left um, from a Mercury-like body to, on the far right, a Jupiter-like body. And as you go from left to right, it's the amount of silicates, which are followed by the amount of water, and then hydrogen and helium, which progressively increases as we move to the right. And by the time JUICE, if it is selected next week by ESA, by the time JUICE reaches the, the Jupiter system in 2030, we don't yet know how many thousands of planets would have been discovered but what we do know is only two of these families will have been properly characterized. The Mercury-like ones, thanks to Messenger and Bepi Colombo, and of course the Earth-like ones. And so what JUICE is going to do by its exploration of Ganymede is it will characterize the best example we have in our solar system of an entire class of planets, which are the water worlds. This slide here shows you a very brief overview of JUICE. As I've said, it's a European-led mission to the Jupiter system, um, and it will really be the first orbiter of an icy moon. And the theme that um, we're focusing on today is that of the emergence of habitable worlds around gas giants. And if we focus on this theme, what we will do to achieve this goal is, as I've said, we will study the three, three of the large icy moons at Jupiter, we will focus on Ganymede, which is the largest satellite in the solar system. And Ganymede has a deep ocean and we think is the best example of a liquid environment which is trapped between two ice layers. We will also study Callisto, which is the only known example in our solar system of a non-active body, but it has an ocean underneath the surface. And we will also have two flybys of Europa where we think there is a deep ocean, and as Brittany described, it is an active world. And so this is really the best example of a liquid environment which is in contact with silicates underneath. Now, in the Cosmic Vision document, which is what drove the type of missions that ESA wants to fly, it's clearly stated that the quest for evidence of life in the solar system must begin with an understanding of what makes a planet habitable. And this is exactly what JUICE is setting out to do. As you'll see in this picture here, it's now <coughs> commonly accepted that there are two habitable domains in every stellar system. A very narrow one, shown on the left, where the water can be in liquid form at the surface of the planet, such as we have on Earth. And the position of this domain is going to be driven by the temperature variations away from the star. And so if you move from top down to bottom, the stars are less massive and less bright as you go. And so what this does is it imposes the fact that the surface habitats, if they exist, must be closer to their star. But on the right, there is a much larger habitable domain, a zone where water is very abundant and where liquid water could be found in deep reservoirs or oceans. And this second domain is beyond the snow line. So it's essentially at distances away from the star where the temperature is below the freezing point of water. And in this domain, water is as abundant as silicates. And the Jupiter system is in this, is in this region. And that's why JUICE, by exploring Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, will in fact allow us to explore the habitable zone beyond the beyond the snow line. And it'll really pave the way for enabling us to understand what it is that makes a planet habitable in this, in this particular region. 
So the reason we think we can say this is that Ganymede and Europa are in fact two archetypes of two classes of habitable planets. On Europa, shown on the right, we think that the conditions existing at the bottom of the ocean are similar to those of on our oceans where life has formed. No space mission will be able to explore these deep regions, but at least, well, at, at this stage, but at least with JUICE we will be able to explore the recently active zones on the surface, and by doing this we will be able to constrain the likelihood of such habitats and also pave the way for future missions to Europa as well as possibly a future lander. At Ganymede on the left, you'll see that um, listed under occurrence, there are many bodies of the Ganymede type, both in our solar system and beyond. And one of the things we don't understand on Ganymede is whether the exchange <coughs> processes which take place between silicates and liquid water on Europa actually take place on, on, on Ganymede. And so that region with the yellow circle there is the region that we want to try and best understand. If we can answer this question, it will really um, significantly increase the probability of, habiting, of having habitable worlds in our solar system and beyond. And then to finish, um, I just wanted to show the final slide I showed at a presentation we gave to the ESA committees a couple of weeks ago, which really shows um, our understanding of the large gas giants within our solar systems. Um, Following on from Galileo's discovery 400 years ago of the Galilean satellites, what we see here in the background is an artist's impression of a giant exoplanet. And then the timeline you can see moving to the right there shows how our knowledge of the gas giant planets has grown in time. There have been numerous ground-based and Hubble Space Telescope's ob observations of the Jupiter and Saturn systems. There have been flybys of Jupiter and Saturn by the Pioneer and Voyager spacecraft. We had the discovery of deep habitable environments in the ocean ridges on Earth, the orbital tour by the Galileo spacecraft to <coughs> Jupiter, and the ongoing orbital tour of Saturn by the Cassini spacecraft. And then most recently, last month, there was the discovery of the first extrasolar, extrasolar water world. And so from our perspective, it's now time to progress from exploring habitable worlds to now getting an understanding of their, of their characterization. And we'll do this by studying three of the icy moons in detail, and in particular, we will give a thorough exploration of Ganymede, which, as I said at the start, will allow us to characterize an entire, entire class of, of planetary bodies. Thank you. OK, good morning, everyone. I apologize for my voice. I should stop singing opera. It's hard on me. Um, We've heard this morning about Mars. Uh, we've heard about habitable environments on Europa, about exploring the Jupiter system. I want to tell you a, a little bit about some work on uh, Titan, which is the moon in the next giant planet system farther out from Jupiter, and that's the Saturn system. So um, this is some work with uh, my colleagues at JPL, Julie Castillo-Roger, Matthew Chokron, uh, Christophe Sautin, and at the University of Nantes, Gabrielle Toby. And if you uh, need their names, I can provide them uh, after the press conference. Uh, let me start by uh, pointing out that we actually have three moons in the outer solar system that are virtually the same size, and from the point of view of their densities, their mass over volume are virtually identical. And that is from left to right, Callisto, Ganymede, and Titan. Callisto and Ganymede, of course, are in the Jupiter system, and Titan is in the Saturn system. But these two bodies could not be more different from each other in terms of their surfaces. Uh, Callisto, uh, as Michelle said, uh, is a, um, uh, a signpost of the earliest history of the solar system. It shows no evidence of geologic activity. It carries a record of cratering over four and a half billion years. Uh, Ganymede, <clears throat> which is a slightly larger cousin of Jupiter, does show evidence for surface activity, but that activity apparently ended uh, mostly or entirely within the first 20 percent of Ganymede's history. It does have an active magnetic field today, uh, so evidently there is a liquid water ocean, as there may be a Callisto as well. Uh, Titan, on the other hand, at Saturn, again, the same size, same mass, same density, therefore the same, we presume, water to rock ratio, has a very dense atmosphere, denser than the air in this room. 
Uh, the Cassini mission, which is still operating at the Saturn system, has discovered methane rain and rivers on Titan, uh, ethane, methane lakes and seas uh, in the polar regions of Titan. And from Cassini studies, we know that this methane is not stable in the atmosphere. It's broken apart by ultraviolet light quickly enough that the methane that we see in the present system, methane-driven, you can call it, hydrologic system on Titan today, will be gone in the next few tens of millions of years. So the question is, what is it that drives internal activity on Titan to outgas more methane, to keep methane going uh, effectively as the working fluid at Titan's surface over four and a half billion years. So my colleagues and I set out <clears throat> to try to understand this and we um, calculated what's called an interior model. Uh, I won't go through the equations, but basically uh, we uh, make sure we conserve mass. We don't lose any mass. We assume this body is supported by, um, uh, by its, uh, the rigidity of its materials. Uh, and we have equations that describe the properties of these materials. Again, Titan is primarily rock and ice, but if that were the end of the story, then we couldn't explain why there is this activity. So in fact, what we've done is we've, we've put in everything we know about Titan chemically. And uh, so what we end up with is really an, an object that's being basted in its own juices after four and a half billion years. And of course, we have ice at the surface, so we do have Titan a la mode. Um, and so what we do is we make sure that um, we not only have ice, but we also add water to the rock itself. Uh, that is, we have what's called hydrated silicates, which are uh, very common on the earth at the ocean floor. Uh, and uh, we need to do this in order to match the gravity data that Cassini has provided us about Titan. Number two, um, we add methane to the crust, and we don't simply have methane mixed with water ice, but we assume that it's in the form of what's called a gas hydrate or clathrate hydrate, again, very common in the Earth's uh, crust in the Gulf of Mexico, was probably the cause of the BP tragedy, large amounts of methane stored in gas hydrates. On Titan, what the methane hydrate does is it makes the crust more insulating thermally and more rigid, which holds the heat in. And then um, the heat source for Titan is, in large part, decay of radiogenic elements in the core. Uh, we leach some of the potassium from that core into the ocean. Uh, that's a process that occurs as the rock and the water come into con contact with each other. And then we heat gently for four and a half billion years. Uh, we take it out of the, our, uh, our oven, our computer, and we end up with something like this. So this is the model of Titan we've come up with, and it's very different from prior models. Um, there are two rocky cores here. The inner one is <clears throat> depleted in water. Uh, in water. It is so-called anhydrous. It's very dense. Uh, the outer one, represented by the green uh, serpentine uh, beautiful marble depiction, is the hydrated silicate. And at present, uh, Titan's outer core is dehydrating. It's hot enough. The water's being released from the rock and it's going into the ocean above that. And I point out now that with this hydrated core, the rock is much closer to the surface than in standard models because there's so much water in the rock that it's effectively puffed up. It takes up more volume and that fits the Cassini gravity data. Because of the insulating methane clathrate hydrate, the interior is warmer today than it otherwise would have been and that allows for activity to occur, but it also means that the liquid water ocean that has been um, in fact, evidence for which has been uh, hinted at in Cassini data, uh, actually is in contact with or nearly in contact with the rock. There is no intervening high pressure ice layer. And that's very different from prior Titan models. And you can imagine a scene somewhat like this at the Earth's own ocean floor, where hot water and um, other chemicals are being pumped out of the dehydrating rock core uh, into the uh, water ocean of Titan. And so that potentially makes that. Uh, a, uh, an interesting site for either life or prebiotic chemistry. Now, how are we going to test models like this? Well, there are two missions uh, that um, are first uh, in process, and the other uh, we hope will be selected by NASA this summer. The Cassini mission has moved into the solstice mission phase, which we hope to operate until 2017, uh, when the Saturn system reaches northern summer solstice, the first day of summer in the north. And during this time, the observations that Cassini will make will refine our understanding of the mass distribution inside Titan to test this model and also look for evidence of methane outgassing. On the right, you see a depiction of a mission that's currently in competition 
for NASA's discovery program, the Titan Mare Explorer would send a capsule directly to Titan, land on one of the large hydrocarbon seas in the north. I'm the deputy PI for this mission. Ellen Stofan is the PI. Um, this is not a mission in competition with JUICE. It's in a separate program at NASA called Discovery. Uh, it's in a final phase competition with two other missions uh, not related to the giant planets of the outer solar system. But what time will do is analyze the chemistry of the surface lakes and seas in part to see whether there is a connection with the deeper interior uh, and uh, in fact whether there's active outgassing at sites uh, like these large lakes and seas today. So in concert with uh, JUICE at Jupiter, uh, we hope to continue the exploration of Titan and fully understand the nature of these uh, icy worlds that indeed uh, may be part of a very broad habitable zone in our own outer solar system. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent presentations. Very good. Uh, are there any questions? Hi, Jonathan Amos, BBC News. Um, Michelle, looking through the other uh, JUICE document that um, is going before the SPC next week, there seems to be a, about a 70 million euro opportunity for, for the U.S. So what, what do you want from, from the U.S.? What can they most usefully do if they were to pick up that opportunity? I have to be very careful because I am, I have a vested interest because I'm going to be proposing for an instrument on JUICE if it goes ahead, but my understanding is there are discussions taking place between ESA and NASA at the moment about instrumentation that NASA would like to provide to JUICE. I don't know if there are details of specific instruments that are being talked about, but we are, I'm very much aware that there is a great deal of expertise in the U.S. on outer planetary instrumentation. And my understanding is a number of the, um, of the teams that are working on instruments they would like to propose if an AO goes out have a number of U.S. scientists on them. So I do not know any details about specific instrumentation, but I would very much hope that there will be U.S lead instruments and U.S. co-eyes on European lead ones, because if Cassini is anything to go by, that's the best way to get the best science, is to choose the best scientists and the best instrumentation. So it was a very long answer to, I don't know the details of the uh, question. <laughs> um, yeah, because I mean, that sort of money is, about, is, on, is on the order of about two instruments. That's right, it? yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. And, um, and then, Brittany, you'll get two flybys. In 2031, I don't know how old we'll all be in 2031. Uh, I, I, I'm trying not to work that out at the moment, yeah. Uh, 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 I'll be four, 41. Wow. <laughs> Just saying that to make us feel bad. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, 51. That's in 30s, better. yeah, there we go. Fantastic. Better at it. Better uh, at it. What, what will we get from those two flybys? I mean, you, you know the mission. What will we get? Yeah, actually, I, what I'm really excited about is that the, the active area that I showed you... Um, let me see there. if I can yep. go back here. Um, so if you, if you look right here, these are actually two regions on top. This is Theramacula, which was the kind of the showstopper in the, the paper that we had in Nature in November. Um, and this is the region that we think is still currently active and still forming. On the bottom is Thrace Macula, which is a somewhat older feature, we believe, but still has these indications for water moving around um, out of the feature itself. Um, these two are located in the same region of Europa's surface. They look about like this if you were to look at that area. Um, they're also on the uh, anti-Jovian side, so what's great about them is that they're in a low radiation environment. And so, in fact, these are the, these are, these are on one of the flybys. So one of the flybys is currently planned to go basically swipe through uh, Thrace and then head over to Theramacula. And so those two flybys are, I think, really incredibly powerful because the locations that the JUICE team has selected are the places that we can learn the most about Europa. The other feature or the other area um, goes over some uh, geology called bands that we think are, are um, examples of extension of, of Europa's icy lithosphere. So what we might understand in two flybys is, is a, a lot more about um, how Europa works, and particularly I'm excited because uh, the mission contains an ice penetrating radar, which, um, as, I, as I showed at the end of my presentation, is capable of, of detecting subsurface water. Um, so it's an entire dimension of Europa 
Europa that we've never really had access to. Um, in, in the Galileo data, what we're showing here is three dimensions. We're showing surface topography, but this is an entirely different way to think of, of three dimensions. It's dimensions into the ice. And so um, there's uh, basically a chance for us to get a picture of, of how Europa works as a system, which is really what we're missing in terms of understanding whether it's habitable or not. So I'm, I'm really excited that, that they've chosen uh, Thera and Thrace particularly. And we didn't just do it. We didn't just pull it out of a hat. We actually <laughs> looked very closely at the work that Brittany had done, and we talked in detail too. It's nice because it's a hypothesis test. Yeah. Um, so, so often what planetary science is doing is, is going out and seeing new things and then asking new questions. But this, this really gives us a chance to test real hypotheses and, and further the science. So I think it's really great. Jonathan Tyron with Bloomberg. Um, Michelle, could you just clarify again for a novice um, when the decision on juice will be made and give us some, give me an outline of like the kind of uh, budget framework um, involved here and okay. when the mission, when the rocket actually lifts off, okay. when that would be. Okay. Um, it's been through every uh, ESA committee it needs to go through except the final one. And that meeting will take place on the 2nd of May next week. I would hope we would find out by the end of day or the 3rd of May. I must conf confess I'm not sleeping very well right now. I don't need to get to next week. But if the decision is that JUICE goes ahead, it will be the first large class mission to fly. It will, an open announcement of opportunity will go out probably a month after the decision. Teams will have three to four months to respond to that. It will then go into a study phase of about 18 months to make sure that everything is on track. All being well, it will be launched in 2022. There is a backup launch <coughs> a year later. It will take us eight years to get to the Jupiter system, and then the mission will, will, will begin. At this stage, the mission will, will last for three years, but all being well, it will, there will be an extension after that. Sorry, I think I've forgot part of your question. Uh, Just, I mean, how much does it oh, cost, much cost, does it yes, yes. Um, uh, JUICE has been costed by um, external committees at, I think it's 830 million euros. Um, that does not include the cost of the instrumentation. The way that it works in ESA is the different European um, countries will help fund the different instruments. And that will be part of the decision that will take place next week, is whether the, the different uh, delegates to the ESA committee, SPC, feel that their countries will be able to fund the different instruments. Um, but that eight, 830 million euros is, is the, the cost to ESA of building the spacecraft, flying the spacecraft, and actually operating it as well. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, um, if not, uh, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you all for coming. The next press conference is at 1 and is on climate change and the problem of climate sensitivity with Michael Mann, Michael Gill, and Jim Hansen. Thank you.